thanks a lot for the invitation. It's a, it's a really a great honor for me to um, uh, be speaking after uh, two um, highly uh, distinguished uh, scholars that really have uh, influenced my work a lot and I, that I hugely uh, respect. And uh, obviously uh, today uh, we've learned a lot already. Um, so I will be uh, looking at the, the question of energy security uh, along the new Silk Road, taking a, a, a broader perspective to the Silk Road than, than what we have been discussing so far, being the Belt and Road. So I'm, I'm not just looking at Chinese uh, projects, I'm also looking at, in fact, I will spend quite a lot of time on uh, Russia's foreign investments along the same uh, um, axis, along the same road. Uh, so there are, there are many silk roads, if you, if you, if you wish. Uh, uh, the Belt Road is one, but, but, but Ch uh, Russia, obviously, and other countries are also very active in the same area, in, in a way competing. So the question that I would like to uh, try to uh, answer with my presentation is whether foreign investments in the energy sector, in particular in Central Asia, uh, are, are a driver, are a positive co contributor to market reform or, or an obstacle to market reform. And this uh, question, I want to situate it in the debate uh, that uh, we had uh, in part in the two previous presentations on the, the, the determinants of foreign investments. Um, so are investments made on a commercial basis and if yes, then we can assume that these investments are going to help drive reform because the host countries want to create a market environment that is attractive to commercially driven investors. But there is another possible, uh, there's another perspective and that is investments that are not made on a commercial basis, investments that are made on a strategic basis, on a, a, a geopolitical basis, pursuing uh, strategic purposes. Um, and if that's the case, then obviously these investments could be an obstacle to market reform because they, they no longer require the host countries to try to create an attractive commercial or market environment. Uh, investments will come anyway because they are not driven by uh, commercial purposes, but by um, geopolitical purposes. So uh, my focus, and, and so this is part of a, a book I've published last year, uh, on, 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 yes, on, uh, the title is Energy Security Along the New Silk Road. And uh, the focus of the book and of today's presentation is on Central Asia. Now, Central Asia is a fascinating case study for, for energy research, obviously. And that is because it's, it's very rich in energy and in all kinds of energy sources. So you have uh, coal in, in um, a lot of coal in Kazakhstan, uh, oil and gas as well, of course a lot of gas and, and um, um, in Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, and then a significant water resources in Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan. Now, the, the, the paradox here is that these countries are major energy uh, or hold major energy resources, but at the same time, they're really under huge pressure from an energy security perspective. In fact, they're facing energy poverty. Why? Well, because, uh, uh, they have not invested sufficiently in maintaining and modernizing in expanding their downstream energy infrastructure. I'm mainly referring to electricity, uh, but also combined heat and power, district heating, and of course also gas supply. And I'm focusing really on the supply of these energies um, to the local population, to the local industry, rather than their exports uh, to China. At the same time, there are huge institutional constraints that are, um, you know, making it difficult to operate in these jurisdictions. And the region is of high strategic relevance. It's, it's uh, obviously, I mean, some have said, it's in the middle of a new great game between China, Russia, uh, the EU plays a role, Iran, India, the US, of course, as well. And, and the question is, the extent to which this is, great game, this, this geopolitical um, relevance of the region influences on local energy security and then on, the, um, on what states need to do to achieve local energy security. So um, now I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a, a lawyer, 
I work for the Faculty of Law at CUHK. I teach and research energy law, energy regulation. And um, so when we look at energy security, we look at it from a, a, the, the perspective of market regulation. And so this is, of course, also economic, but there is also a regulatory dimension to that, legal dimension. And usually, so in many parts of the world, um, energy security is achieved through um, the creation of market incentives, signals to investors. This is particularly the case in, in liberalized markets, in reformed markets. And the textbook reform requires mar uh, uh, prices to be deregulated. That means uh, forms based on supply and demand. Uh, if, if prices are not deregulated, then tariffs must be co at cost recovery levels. Tariffs remain uh, anyway uh, in place for natural monopolies, the networks. Payment collection must be uh, ensured. And the, the textbook theory also uh, in, um, actually advocates the role, the positive contribution of foreign investors. Foreign investors have a positive role to play in reforming markets. As I said, uh, if states want to attract commercial uh, companies, private companies, they need to create the right market conditions. And so the World Bank and the ADB um, and the EBRD have been advocating these textbooks reforms uh, in many parts of the world you know, to create a commercially viable, viable environment for in investments in energy security. So let me start with the first component, which is price uh, deregulation. So again, if, the, 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 if countries want to achieve, or if countries want to attract investors on a commercial basis, following the textbook uh, approach, they need to open uh, price formation to the market. So, so free market price formation should be the, the rule. And this is what has been advocated in Central Asia and to a certain extent uh, accepted by the Central Asian countries. So they have followed this, te this textbook uh, approach following the instructions of the World Bank. Now, far from all countries, um, but some of them have actually tried at least or somehow recognized the, the idea. And, in, in, and uh, at least in one case, Kazakhstan, they have actually implemented deregulation for a, for a little while. Very quickly, the government re-entered uh, the price formation space, interfering with uh, prices, capping prices. Um, one very interesting case is uh, it's actually an arbitration between the American Energy Systems Company against Kazakhstan, where uh, the American company invested at the beginning of the 2000s, hoping that Kazakhstan would follow uh, uh, the the reform promises it announced um, following the textbook template proposed by the World Bank and as recognized in, in the regulations and the laws of Kazakhstan. But very quickly, the company uh, faced interference with uh, price decisions. And, and very interestingly, what, what we see in Kazakhstan is the idea of uh, forcing the company that makes a profit from uh, energy prices from energy sales to actually reinvest that profit in the infrastructure. Now, this might sound kind of, uh, I mean, from a purely commercial perspective, it might sound shocking. It can actually be explained based on some legacies, some institutional legacies that date from the Soviet Union. Where during the Soviet Union, companies could actually get a profit from their activities, but they had to reinvest that profit in further developing uh, the infrastructure. So we see here, uh, the point I'm trying to make here is that Kazakhstan, in order to attract commercially driven investments in its electricity sector, adopted textbook reforms, but very quickly um, uh, uh, actually failed to implement these reforms because of some uh, deep-rooted institutional legacies. This, this uh, as I said, this idea of distrust of uh, the market and use of profit to finance infrastructure. Um, tariff reforms, as I said, are another key component. Now, in principle, tariffs have to be cost recovery and, and guarantee a certain profit. 
uh, to the investors. In practice, and so that is actually recognized in most laws, if not all laws, of Kazakhstan, um, of Central Asia, sorry, the, the, the natural monopoly regulation, laws and regulations. In practice, however, prices tariffs remain exceptionally low in most jurisdictions, and companies really struggle to recover their costs in, in sometimes even their, their operating expenses, let alone their, their capital expenses. And this is really because of the social sensitivity of price increases. So the World Bank, the Asian Development Bank have been advocating ambitious uh, tariff reforms based on the principle of cost recovery. But this has really uh, been very difficult to implement because of this, again, deep rooted institutional uh, informal constraint, which is social sensitivity of energy pricing. And this I can really illustrate, I mean, how sensitive pricing is um, based on the 2010 revolution in Kyrgyzstan, where the administration was essentially removed from office, uh, partly uh, following a decision by the government to actually increase electricity prices. So again, a very, we see a very significant institutional barrier to moving towards a commercially oriented uh, energy market. Payment collection is another major problem in Central Asia. Laws and regulations recognize energy as a good. And if buyers do not pay their energy bills, they are supposed to be disconnected and courts actually play a role in enforcing that. But there are major institutional obstacles actually to the implementation of these laws and, and, and regulations and even judicial decisions. And one, I mean, several important aspects include, for instance, the role of strategic players, such as the aluminum industry or uh, the, the, the agricultural sector. They are, they are playing such an important social and industrial fu function that the government can actually uh, be reluctant to enforce payment. Uh, and in fact, it's a way of subsidizing them to let them um, uh, uh, forego for on their um, debts. So what do we see? We see lasting institutional constraints. And to some extent that can be linked to the social, uh, to, to what happened uh, in the Soviet Union. Now, I know in Central Asia, there is kind of a, uh, a feeling that they, they don't want to hear about the Soviet Union anymore. And, they, they, they moved. They moved on, and and and. But still, I believe that many of these barriers that I have identified can actually be traced to what was uh, happening in the Soviet Union. Some of the economic uh, approaches that governed the organization of energy markets in the Soviet Union. And so these are deep-rooted problems. You can't not. You cannot just um, reform them uh, easily uh, by implementing just or, or adopting a textbook approach as advocated by the development banks. Now, taking that into account, what is the role of foreign investments? Now, as I said, in principle, foreign investments are supposed to play a, a positive role. They are supposed to first drive reform. As I said, if states want to attract foreign capital, they will create an attractive commercial environment, but, then, but possibly based on the textbook reform. At the same time, foreign investments um, uh, are expected to improve efficiency. They are expected to uh, make investments in efficiency improvements. They are expected to be more uh, stringent and, and ruthless maybe even in, enforce, in enforcing payment collection. And, and so what is the situation in, in Central Asia? Well, we've seen some foreign investments taking place um, and making actually a positive contribution. AES what is one example, and it's a slightly controversial case, because of allegations of corruption, but it appears that their investments have led to improved uh, efficiencies, have led to um, modernization of some of the important power plants, combined power, power, power plants, have led to uh, improved payment collection. So they've actually made, a, 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 according to some at least, a decent contribution to improving energy security. However, as I've said, their investment very quickly face some very significant problems. Uh, disputes on prices and tariffs um, were really a very central component to the significant deterioration of their business and eventually their decision to uh, gradually leave the country. 
Yet, so we see a very negative experience here. At, I mean, uh, at, it's positive in the sense that the foreign investor, to some extent, made a contribution to energy security, efficiency, payment collection. It's negative in the sense that eventually the business wasn't good. They ended up in a, in a tariff dispute with the government. So they left the country. Yet, regardless of this uh, 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 negative experience from the investor's perspective, at least, what we see is we, 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 keep, we, see, we see investments taking place. And this, regardless of, as I said, some of the negative experiences that investors have had, but also regardless of these significant market problems that I have just identified, these significant regulatory weaknesses, these significant institutional barriers to the market-oriented organization of energy uh, systems in the region. So we, we see investments taking place, and many of these investments are Russian, but also, of course, Chinese. The one investment very important is the Sanktuda-1 hydropower plant in uh, Tajikistan. Now, how to explain a, a, a significant investment in the construction of a very large hydropower plant in Tajikistan in a market where prices are not cost recovery, where payment collection is not guaranteed, and where there are many institutional problems, very limited judicial protection, etc. Well, uh, it appears that there was actually a deal and that is not, I mean, that's not my uh, conclusion that is actually based on the literature. It appears that there was a deal between Russia and Tajikistan, whereby Tajikistan accepted to uh, prolong the military presence of Russia uh, in the country in exchange of Russia helping Tajikistan to uh, 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 ensure electricity supply by building this hydropower plant. So there seems to be kind of a quick pro quo here between um, uh, Russia and its military interests in, the, in, the, in this very strategic region for, for, for the country and uh, uh, Tajikistan its, and its energy security interests. So it's not a commercial investment, essentially. It's an investment that seems to be um, geopolitical. Uh, similar issues concerning the Kambarata hydropower plant project in Kyrgyzstan, where if you look at it from a commercial perspective and from a market perspective, based on what I've just outlined, I think there are significant questions that can be raised as to whether it's market driven or not. And, in, and again, if you, if you look at the literature, uh, uh, you see different explanations saying, well, actually, here again, it's a military quid pro quo. It's actually linked to um, um, uh, 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 actually closing down the US military bases in Manas. Now, eventually the project wasn't uh, built and it ended up in a dispute uh, and actually in arbitration. Um, another very important case, I think, is Gazprom's decision to buy the entire gas distribution system in Kyrgyzstan, Kyrgyz gas. Now, Kyrgyz gas was extremely poorly uh, managed what uh, accumulated huge debts and uh, didn't even manage to get even any gas at some point because of some tensions with Uzbekistan. So Gazprom came in and bought the entire network for one symbolic dollar, taking over the debt. Now, if you look at the website of uh, Gazprom in Tajikistan, you will see that, now, first of all, they emphasize the fact that they are not selling gas to the Kyrgyz population at cost recovery levels. They explicitly acknowledge that. And they present that as actually as a present to the, to the Kyrgyz people. Um, so that was, that's, what, that's what you can see from the, 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 the website of Gazprom in Kyrgyzstan. In Tajikistan, Gazprom's website explicitly acknowledges that uh, uh, Tajikistan is of strategic interest to Russia and therefore to the Gazprom group. Gazprom is interested in preserving the stable economic situation in Central Asia and Tajikistan. Therefore, Gazprom invests in Tajikistan as a strategic partner. So it's not just about purely profit, it's also about essentially geopolitics. Now, I just want to say one more thing here about the Kyrgyz project and make the link with what I said before on market reform. 
you have here an investment that is being made in a jurisdiction where the, mar the gas market doesn't function properly at all. Prices are not cost recovery, and that is explicitly acknowledged by the company. Yet the investment is made. Now, even more interestingly, what you see, if you look at the agreement uh, between the intergovernmental agreement between Russia and Kyrgyzstan uh, on this particular deal, you will see that Kyrgyzstan commits to Russia, and, and there is an arbitration clause in the agreement, so it can be enforced to arbitra before arbitration. Kyrgyzstan commits to Russia um, to stop the reform of its gas market. So Kyrgyzstan announced before that the deal, it announced um, far-reaching reforms in terms of unbundling of the gas system, uh, price reforms, etc. So really following the World Bank textbook. But it announced that it would stop. I mean, in fact, it committed in an international agreement to stop these reforms and to buy gas exclusively from Gazprom. So. Uh, uh, this obviously can be, I mean, this is obviously very bad news for the commercial organization of the gas market in the country, and obviously for the energy independence uh, of the country, because it by law commits to buy all its gas from one particular source. Uh, now, what about uh, Chinese investments? Now, Chinese investments are making a big contribution too. Uh, some are very controversial, like in Kyrgyzstan, Bishkek, uh, others less. Uh, but still, it's unclear what the commercial basis is. The example here is the uh, combined power plant in Dushanbe, uh, Tajikistan, where uh, apparently uh, it was, uh, so that's basically an Exim Bank loan. Um, uh, the project is built by TBA and operated, so it's a built operate transfer agreement, uh, arbitration in Hong Kong, actually. And oh, actually, I'm not sure for this one, for the, the Bishkek one it is. Uh, but uh, here, apparently, the deal was that uh, TBA would get a, uh, access to a gold mine in exchange of the project. Now, again, difficult to see how this fits with the textbook uh, approach. It's clearly uh, a part of um, perhaps a more geopolitical agenda relating to access to strategic resources. So what do we see here? We see that foreign investments are made in the absence of market reform. Now, that has significant implications, I believe, for market reform uh, on its own, because it's, if investments are made in the absence of reform, it clearly reduces the urgency of reform. And in fact, in certain cases, it can even block reform, as we see in the case of the, the Russia-Kyrgyzstan gas agreement. So we, we hear a lot about the debt trap uh, Chinese, uh, from the Chinese uh, BRI uh, perspective. Now, there is another perspective to that which is not necessarily a debt trap, it's really um, foreign investments made for strategic purposes can actually block market reform. And that will make it difficult actually to, um, uh, imp so actually to reorganize the system in a commercially viable way, which in the end then will make it more difficult for the host countries to service their loans, because they will find it more difficult to actually uh, transfer or reorganize the system on a commercial basis, um, implement cost recovery, uh, tariff reforms, etc. Okay, so I just want to conclude here. I think I've exceeded my time. There are deep rooted um, institutional challenges to energy market reform uh, that make it very difficult for investors to operate in these jurisdictions. Um, and this has actually created we could say uh, a possibility for certain investors uh, that are not driven by commercial purposes, uh, but perhaps by strategic purposes and get state support um, to make investments that are not commercially driven. Um, and this has had effect on the uh, state of the market, the extent to which the market can actually uh, uh, be organized in a commercially, uh, commercially viable way. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Booth. Uh, it was a very interesting presentation that uh, I think also shows that other countries also have very strategic interests 
in uh, in Central Asia, like like Russia, for instance. Um, I think there are a couple of questions. Maybe let's take one uh, from Barry. Barry, would you like to read it aloud? Sure. You spoke about the liberalization promise, and I was wondering as you spoke uh, whether this applied with regard to the BRI, uh, particularly um, in Central Asia, in the various sectors in which Chinese firms are involved. That is, when they have their involvement, do they do so with the expectation of uh, liberalization being forthcoming? And has that expectation been met? Okay, so, so this is a very important question. And um, uh, what I want to say is, is I want to link that to the discussion on conditionality of loans. When you see the World Bank or the Asian Development Bank making in, or it, European Bank for Construction and Development and other banks actually making investments in the energy infrastructure in Central Asia. And they are very important investors, obviously. Um, they link that to certain conditionality requirements. And, and it's mostly linked to, um, well, textbook reforms in a way or adjustments to it. And so this, uh, for instance, is very clear from the EBRD um, publications and websites but they are not the only one. And in China, you don't see so much of a conditionality, at least uh, it might be a gold mine, uh, but that's not formally, uh, I mean, that's not, I haven't seen any kind of official proof of that. So there is much less of a conditionality in terms of reforming the market. And that, that, is, that is part of um, an additional actually problem in terms of reorganizing these markets on a commercial and, and market um, basis because these investments are being made without um, demand of reforming um, these markets uh, and, and, and making them more sustainable from, I mean, at least from a financial perspective, from a commercial perspective. And so you see, uh, in a way, uh, a, a kind of contradiction here between international finance institutions advocating for reform and then um, other major investors, for instance, along the Belt and Road, are investing without uh, conditionality. And um, that obviously doesn't uh, necessarily contribute to uh, market reform. Now, of course, another key question is whether the textbook reform is the right template for the Central Asian countries and whether, you know, whether it's right to advocate liberalization, privatization, uh, unbundling, third party access, etc. And so here, um, perhaps China has a role to play in, you know, promoting an alternative market reform approach and, and, and uh, you know, promoting perhaps um, an approach that, that is less uh, driven, uh, less um, liberal in a certain way. Perhaps that would fit better in the institutional uh, framework that I've just um, outlined. Thank you. <laughs> 